So uh, now we'll continue with the story of Jacob and we will miss the story of Isaac uh, because Isaac is just a transitional character in the book of Genesis. Of course, he is an important character, but we will see that uh, the scripture pays more attention to the story of Abraham and to the story of Jacob. So let us start uh, studying the story of Jacob. And it is also a very fascinating story with many, many interesting details. So when we speak about the structure of the story of Jacob, there are two ways how we can present the structure. The first way, we can uh, present it as a uh, chiasm. And uh, it was discovered long ago. And uh, the phrase in the center of the chiasm is very, very important. God remembers Rachel and she gave birth to Joseph. And uh, this is a phrase God remembers. If you, uh, if you, if you remember, for example, uh, when we uh, spoke about the story of oh. Noah about the flood. Mm -hmm. So uh, the the flood story could be also presented as a chiasm, and in the center of the chiasm there is a phrase God remembered Noah. So this phrase God remembered doesn't mean that God. Uh, forgets, but actually it means that it means that it is a, a covenant language. So uh, God starts working as a covenant partner, and He intervenes in the situation. Another way how we can present the story of uh, Jacob is like two parallel panels, and both uh, presentations are, are work quite well. For example, uh, we can see that. Uh, this parallel, uh, the first one, the first panel is uh, how Jacob uh, went to Haran and uh, came back. So he returned to the promised land. And the second panel is parallel. So Jacob again uh, starts uh, when Jacob is the, in the promised land. And after that, uh, he uh, had to leave uh, promised land because of the famine. And finally, he returned back to the promised land, but we know that he is not returned alive, but he was, uh, he was uh, brought back to the promised land after his, after his death. And we can see that uh, there are some parallels in, in the presentations of Jacob's story. So two variants are very, very possible. And now, uh, when we speak about the story of Jacob, we can see that uh, this is the main issue in this story is the issue of blessing. And uh, the word blessing in Hebrew is Behara, Behara. No, sorry, Beracha. Beracha. And uh, the blessing in the, in the book of Genesis is the idea of blessing is intertwined with the idea of uh, birthright. And the birthright in Hebrew is Bekora. So when we compare to what's Beracha and Bekora, we will see that actually it is almost the same word, only two letters are, uh, the, the order of two letters are changed. And if we remove the <coughs> vowels because they were added later, so we can see that the words are very, very similar to each other. And in this case, uh, we understand that uh, the author um, uses this play of words because Beracha, blessing, and Bekora, the birthright, is almost the same in the story of uh, Jacob. So uh, in the very beginning, in chapter 25, we can, we can see that uh, uh, the new heroes or new characters are introduced. And we can see that there are two names are given to Esau. One is Admoni and another is Se'ar. Adom and Se'ar. Uh, and actually uh, these two names later on are used uh, to represent or to, to represent the sons of Esau uh, because uh, he is the father of all Edomites and uh, he lived on the Mount Seir, and this is also the place, uh, and this name is also very, very, very common to the, uh, another his name, uh, Esau, uh, 
that comes from the same root. So uh, now uh, I don't, uh, yes. And when we speak about uh, Jacob, uh, and uh, yes, before we go to the name of Jacob, we need to remember how in ancient times people give, gave names to their children because there was no given names. Uh, they usually made up a name uh, after the birth of, the, of a child. And uh, they notice some like behavior of a child or some issues uh, that could characterize the child. And the name was given just according to this uh, to these issues. Uh, and there are many, many examples like this. For example, do you remember in this first Samuel when uh, Pin Pinchas, uh, the, the wife of Pinchas gave birth of the son. So he called him Ichabod, and Ichabod comes from the Hebrew word kavat, kavet, and right. it means that uh, the glory of uh, Yahweh the departed glory. from Israel. So uh, because the Ark of the Covenant was captured. Or uh, the name Peleg, he was named Peleg because in his time the, the land was divided. So do you see some of the circumstances that accompanied the birth of the child? Uh, were used in order to, to give the name of the child. So in this case, it, it, it was true in the story of Jacob and Esau. When Esau was born and because he was red, so he was given the name Edom and because, uh, because he was uh, hairy, so another, his name is Seir or Sear, something like this. And the name Jacob is also comes from the, um, from the root, which means uh, the heel, and also uh, the same root means to cheat. So that is why the name of ya Jacob means actually both the one who is taking the heel and the one who is cheating. And very often the name was not just a name, but the name was just like a destiny of a person. So uh, his name predicted how he should live and what should happen in his life. So this is what I told you by Korah and Beracha, the nouns which are very, very similar uh, to each other. If you remove the vowels, so we can see that only two letters, Kaf and Resh, just change uh, the order of these two letters are changed. And we have these uh, two, uh, two nouns. And uh, Yes, before we go to the blessings, let us pay attention to Genesis chapter 25. And I would like to ask you one very simple, very simple question. So in the end of the chapter, we can see that um, Esau uh, despised his birthright and he easily gave up his birthright for the uh, for the plate of a stew or just for a small portion of food. And uh, I would like to ask you a question. So why do you think Esau so easily gave up his birthright? And we need to remember one important thing. Uh, do you remember that actually um, in the ancient Near East, and in Israel, as, sorry, in Israel as well, the birthright uh, gave some advantages. Uh, the person who was, was born first inherited double portion of, uh, of inheritance. For example, if uh, Jacob, sorry, if Isaac had two sons, so he divided his property not on two parts, but he divided it on three parts. And the one who was born first was supposed to get a double portion. So two thirds of the property of the father, Esau was supposed to inherit. And only one third uh, should be inherited by uh, Jacob. So I would like to ask you a question. So why do you think uh, Esau so easily uh, gave up and re refused to, uh, to get uh, this birthright and gave it, to, gave it over to Jacob. Do you have any ideas about that?
Yes. Yes, please. I think uh, ESO did not uh, did, did not pay attention on the, on uh, the birthright. He he neglected it. Uh, I think uh, he was uh, was not able to think deep about that. Okay, thank you. So one more question in, in this case. So uh, why, in this case, why did he uh, later on try to, to get it back? So do you remember in chapter 20, 27, he tries to get it back. So if it is not very, very important for him, I think he discovered that it was very important, but after, after what? After he was not able to get it again. It was, it was, it was already taken, and he he thought that he he made a mistake. Then he decided to get back what he lose he lost because of his uh, indulgence, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank I you. I can say something about this. Uh, yes, one is a, uh, as a, as how despised the, the bad rights. And in fact, what we know concerning the bad rights in times as the Bible comments is that uh, this is something uh, starting even from the Genesis 3.15, uh, pre prevailing Christ himself. And therefore, Abraham also received the blessings once you read the book of Genesis 12, verse 3, concerning the, the, the firstborns, how they should be used. And in fact, it is a way of despising the spirit of God. And therefore, once you read in Hebrews, 12, 16, and 17, you realize that uh, after once, after now denying his right and his own in God, he tried, uh, he was given time to repent and uh, to come to God, but he, has, he, 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 dis, he despised it in a more uh, length. And therefore, when the days of um, sinking forgiveness were over, is when now, he is termed as a fornicator or somebody who worshiped the idols. And therefore, is where now he was trying to plead again when the time was over. So I think what the Hesau did is a very serious thing. And therefore, it is, uh, it is also uh, trying to to teach us that uh, as we are being caught and we are in a, a we are lineage of Abraham and we are given the rights, therefore we take it very seriously. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Pastor Karani. Uh, I would also, I would also, I would like to uh, add also some some things to to this. So, do you see? Um, I think that the explanation of this. Uh, uh, of this behavior of Esau is very is very clear. So Esau uh, was the one who um, uh, who valued the material part of the blessing, but he didn't value the spiritual part of the blessing. And one more thing that I would like to uh, to pay your attention to is that the events of chapter 25 and chapter 26 are probably uh, the events uh, which are not put in the chronological order, but uh, they should be understood simultaneously. And if we read chapter 26, uh, chapter 26 says, uh, there was another famine in the land 
in addition to the uh, one that had occurred in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines uh, at Gerar and so on and so forth. So uh, do you see the Bible says about the famine in the land. Uh, and when we read at the end of the story 25, we can understand that most probably it uh, happens during this famine because uh, Esau is presented as the person who was a very good hunter, but he was hunting the whole day and he was not able to find any, any prey, any, anything. So uh, we can understand why, uh, because of the famine, uh, the animals and uh, all the living creatures try to, to go away from the land where there is no water, uh, where, there, where there is no food. So he, he spent all the days, all the day, but in vain, he was not able to, to bring anything back. And uh, at, this, at this very moment, uh, when he, he, he came back, actually this dialogue between Esau and Jacob took place. So uh, you, we need to remember that actually um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, they were lived, they lived because of the, um, because of the, um, uh, how this called, because of the cattle, yes? So they, they had a lot of cattle and they were, um, uh, they are you looking uh, for pastoral? Yes, yes, yes. They they mm. traveled from one place to another uh, with a big uh, number of uh, these animals, like sheep or goats, and maybe some um, bigger animals. And uh, from from this, they actually had uh, their property was not the property of the land but their property was just the property of, of sheep and goats. And you can imagine what happened if there is a famine in the land. So if there is a famine, uh, most usually because of the lack of rains, what happened to the grass? It withered. becomes parched and dry. Yes, and many of the it is, it is dry. So it means that there is no uh, food for the animals. So what would happen to the animals? Usually they die. Yes, they will die. Mm -hmm. So we can just assume uh, that most probably at that time, uh, the property of Isaac diminished very much. And if before he was very, very rich, now uh, he's not rich anymore because of, the, of these climate conditions. And most probably in this time, uh, Esau says, so what, what should, what is a profit if I am, if I have a birthright? Because do you see the property of my father is so small that actually two third or half of the property, it actually doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, when we read chapter 26, we can read uh, one interesting detail about, uh, about Isaac. Uh, so we remember that uh, Isaac, uh, Abraham, and Jacob, and all the patriarchs were the nomads. So they were just living because of the, uh, because of the, uh, because of the animals. But in chapter 26, uh, it says that actually uh, Isaac started to be a farmer. So he planted uh, something. Um, So what is written? Well, I cannot find it with this Bible.
Yes, verse 12, 26 and verse 12. Isaac sowed seed in the land, and in that year he reaped a hundred times what was sown. The Lord blessed him, and the man became rich and kept getting richer until he was very wealthy. He had flocks of sheep, herds of cattle, and many slaves. And the Philistines were envious of him. So uh, do you see, most probably Isaac even had to start uh, agriculture, had to start to, to do farming uh, because of the, because uh, his uh, flocks were very, very small. But we see uh, that God actually blessed Isaac and he again became rich. And when sorry, he what verse did you just read, Prof? I'm sorry. Uh, chapter 26 and verse 12. 12 up to 15. Thank you. So he again became rich. And when he became rich, uh, chapter 27 uh, describes what happened. Yes, this is Genesis uh, chapter 26 and verse 12 and on. Uh, so that is why we can explain this behavior of Esau. In the beginning, when his father was poor, he despised his birthright because it uh, doesn't bring uh, or it didn't bring any material advantage for him at that time. But later on, when his father again became rich and wealthy, so he wanted to get it back. And uh, this is uh, what is written in chapter 20, 27. And uh, before we go to chapter 27, I'm more than sure that you know the story very well, so we don't need to, uh, to tell it again, but uh, I would like just to pay your attention to some of the details. So we need to remember that the <clears throat> main part of the blessings in Genesis is uh, like three, three parts, like be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and the third one is about the relationship. Uh, but I also added here rule over. So do you remember when Adam was uh, blessed, he was given the dominion over the, over the land. Uh, but a sin, because of the sin, we can see that all those blessings are distorted. Like uh, children are born in pain. Adam and Eve uh, were cast away from the Garden of Eden. So the land was lost. And the earth, earth was not friendly to people anymore. Uh, later on, we can find uh, one more interesting detail in Noah's blessing. Uh, the relationship between man and nature become even more corrupted. Dominion takes on a tink of fear because it says that all the animals now will be afraid of man. And uh, later on in chapter nine, in the book of Genesis, we can see that when, um, when uh, Noah cursed Canaan, he says about the, uh, about the slavery. He says that he will be a slave to, to his brothers. So in this case, as uh, you see before, we didn't have this aspect. Uh, so the, the dominion uh, was not only uh, when uh, man uh, dominate over the nature, but now the new element was introduced, a dominion of a man over another man. Uh, this was in Genesis 9.25. And of course, one of the most important questions in the book of Genesis, who will inherit the blessing of the covenant? And the main importance of the blessing of the covenant is to restore the broken relationship between God and humanity. In Genesis, it is repeated many times that Abraham, Jacob, Jacob, and their descendants should be uh, the instrument for the blessing of all the nation. And now, let us uh, come to the blessing of, um, of Jacob and Esau. So this is the description of Esau. I will just skip it, uh, because uh, just in two words, Esau is described as a good hunter. And this is the characteristic of Nimrod, the, the builder of Babylon. And uh, most probably this is a negative characteristic. And uh, Jacob is uh, presented as a humble person, Tam or Tamim. 
uh, and no and job are described in the same manner. So we can see that from the very beginning, ESO is described or presented as a, with, the, with the negative characteristics and Jacob is presented as a positive characteristics. Uh, so, as I told you, these, uh, the words blessing and birthright uh, are used almost as synonymous. Uh, and we can find this uh, play of words in some of the verses. For example, Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob, Yaakov? For he has cheated me by Yaakabveni. Do you see the same word from the same root? Two times. He took away my birthright because Bekorati, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing, a birkati. So, do you see that the, the words are very, very similar to each other? Uh, okay, so uh, we, we saw that he despised, uh, Esau despised the, the blessing from the very beginning, and this word bazaar uh, to despise is actually the same word that uh, occurs. Uh, in some other narratives of the Hebrew Bible. And uh, the, the reason may be that Esau gave up his birthright with an oath. So he, he swore that he doesn't want to, to have the birthright. And uh, yes, Esau's story is very similar to the story of Cain. Both of them were firstborn. Cain is associated with the earth and Esau with something red. Uh, Cain kills his brother, Esau threatens to kill his brother. In both cases, the reason for hatred is a blessing. Uh, Jacob's behavior, Jacob's behavior may be presented as a deception of the blind person. Uh, when we uh, read Leviticus chapter 19, verse 14, and Deuteronomy 27, and verse 18, especially in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, where it says, that the one who uh, cheated the blind person should be cursed. So, and this is exactly the case of Jacob because his father, Isaac, was, uh, was almost blind, so he couldn't see very well. And uh, Jacob uh, tries to, to cheat on him, so he tries to, to present himself as his brother. So according to this verse in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Jacob was supposed to get a curse instead of the blessing while he was uh, uh, cheating or while he was cheating. Yes, and uh, Jacob called his, uh, calls himself Esau two times and he also uh, uses the name of God uh, when Isaac asked him oh, why you have uh, why did you come back so so fast he answered because the Lord your God granted me success so he even involved God in his deception and the question that we uh, need to ask ourselves uh, so uh, Jacob of course he stole the blessing of his uh, brother but uh, do you see, according to all this uh, issue that we discussed right now, he was not supposed to be blessed. On the contrary, he is supposed to be cursed. And the question is, uh, did this, uh, uh, was, uh, was this stolen blessing working in the life of Jacob? And now let us go to the, to the, uh, to the text of the of the blessing, so uh, Isaac, uh, when Jacob came, came to him, he pronounced this blessing: "May God give you of the dew of heaven, and of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers." And may your mother's son bow down, bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Okay, now I just have a simple question. Do you think that this blessing uh, came true in the life of Jacob? Uh, 
Let us consider Come several again, parts. Please. Yes, yes, please, Pastor Michel. Come again on the question, please. So the question is, do you think this blessing came true in the life of Jacob? Yes. Okay. Mm. So uh, why? Because it was prophesied before that he will be the ruler over his brother. Okay. Okay. So, and uh, you think yes. that it happened yes. in, in his life? Yes. Okay. Um, Prof. Yes, please. Yeah. I I think it was it was greatly not fulfilled because we see uh, Jacob instead of people serving him him serving he serves seven years for his wife mm -hmm. and then he gets uh, he's cheated and then he has to serve another seven years to get her and mm -hmm. even though his work was blessed. But even of the work that he was blessed, he was being cheated by, by Laban. And uh, when he met his brother, finally, after a long time, he is the one who bowed down to Esau. And he said to Esau that I am your servant. Correct. Instead of Correct. Esau serving him. Um, so you see that a lot, of, a lot of the blessing that he was meant to receive he never really received it in the sense, of course, God was with him in some way that he, God exercised mercy towards him. But in the way that the, the, uh, the, the blessing is, 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 is given, he was not, he was not, uh, I mean, <laughs> you can even, I don't know if this would be a stretch, but you see him even, uh, his, his, his land was not even blessed because there was a famine where he was and he had to go to Egypt yes, and yes, uh, sort of bow to his son. So it's not only to his brother that he became or he, he bowed to, but even to his own son, uh, um, Joseph, when he went to Egypt. Mm -hmm. Yes, very well, uh, very good exposition. And actually uh, you are right. Uh, for example, uh, the first sentence, may God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. You are right, in the end of his life, he didn't have this because there was a famine in the land and the famine was so severe that he had to go to Egypt. So do you see this blessing didn't actually fulfilled in his, in his life. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. So this is also didn't fulfill because as Pastor Foswa said, instead of, uh, instead of other people served him, he himself served other people, especially uh, in the time when he was in, uh, in the household of Laban. And I would also add a little bit more to this. Uh, do you remember how many years, uh, how many years, uh, Jacob uh, did, uh, how many years did Jacob serve to, to Laban? Not 14 years? Not 14, 14 years. Uh, he, he served uh, seven years for uh, one wife, seven years for another wife, yes. and six more years. So in total, he spent 20 Fair. years there. Yeah, 20, 20 years. Okay, it is clear uh, he, he spent seven years for one wife, seven years for another wife, and six years for what? The Bible says for the cattle, for the flocks, and for everything. But when we read chapter 31 of the book of uh, Genesis, here we can find one very interesting detail. Uh, do you remember, uh, actually, uh, God himself pushed Jacob to go away from, from Laban. Uh, so he appeared to him and said, it is enough for you to stay here. You have to come back uh, to, your, to your home. And uh, when uh, Laban 
uh, knew about that that Jacob just uh, has gone. Uh, so he 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 chased him, and when they met, when they met, Laban says one interesting uh, words. Uh, he says some very very interesting words. Uh, let me read uh, for you. Excuse me, Prof. Can we now say that? Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, Prof. Yes, yes, please. Uh, ca can I say that um, through deception that Jacob did to his father affected so much because and deception is a, a serious sin and therefore affected uh, of course. the blessed of course. lineage that Abraham was uh, commanded by God that everything shall always uh, in a work in a goodness in his way. Uh, yes, we will speak about it later. We will see that all the bad things that Jacob did, they return back to him. So it looks like it is a law of uh, boom, like boomerang. So when you, you do something, it comes back to you. And we will see it later on. So let me read one verse from the Bible. So I cannot find the source. Yes, verse 43. Verse 43, 43 in chapter 31. Then Laban answered Jacob, the daughters are my daughters, the sons my sons, and the flocks my flocks. Everything you see is mine. But what can I do today for these daughters of mine or for the children they have born? Come now, let's make a covenant, you and I. Let it be a witness between the two of us. So now in this verse 43, uh, Laban says that uh, daughters are my daughters and the sons are my sons and the flocks my flocks. So actually what he is saying, he is saying that of course the daughters, uh, the, uh, the wives of Jacob are his daughters. But he says that even the sons that were born to, to Jacob are my sons. So it looks like he uh, claims uh, the, that, he, uh, that all of them belongs to him, not to Jacob. And we can find one more interesting uh, connection when we read the uh, book of Exodus. And chapter 20, 21, book of Exodus and chapter 21. So this is exactly after the 10 commandments. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he is to serve for six years, <clears throat> then 
in the sermons, he is to live as a free man without paying anything. If he arrives alone, he is to live alone. If he arrives with a wife, his wife is to live with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children belong to her master and the man must live alone. This is Exodus chapter 21 and verses from, uh, from one to, to four. Yes. <clears throat> it looks like this story fits very well, or uh, this law fits very well at uh, the situation of Jacob. Because do you remember, he came to Laban alone. He didn't have wife at that time. And Lab Laban gave him two of his daughters as wives. So we can assume, we can assume that Jacob was not uh, just a servant, but it looks like he was a slave in uh, the house of Laban. Do you understand this? Uh, so that is why he served seven years for one a wife, seven years for another wife, and six years, Please. It looks like six years he served for himself. And according Please. to the law of the book of Exodus, if he is a slave and he came to his master alone, he was supposed to uh, leave alone. So Please. he's not Please. supposed to take his wives and his uh, children. Everything should remain in his uh, uh, father-in-law's house. I have a question there, please. Mo pa pro pardon? I have a question, suggestion there. Yes, please. Uh, really, Jacob was a slave to Laban or was there as a, a one among his uh, children? Oh, this is a good question. And yes. in order to understand this question, uh, we need to understand that the slavery in the ancient time was not as mm, as bad as we usually mm -hmm. understand it in our days. Uh, so the slaves uh, could have much more rights than... So uh, usually when we speak about the slaves, what picture do we have in, in our mind? Uh, the slaves slavery, in North America. In North, yes, correct. Mm -hmm. When uh, the slaves were, were not considered people anymore, they were considered like like animals. But in ancient times, it was it was not like that. So do you remember Eliezer was a slave in the household of Abraham, and Abraham even uh, wanted to promote him to be his heir. So, so uh, <clears throat> Eliezer was supposed to inherit all the property of the master. Or just imagine uh, Joseph. He was a slave in the house of Potiphar, but actually he, he was his right hand. So his life was not as bad as, uh, as the life of, of a slave. And usually in ancient times, uh, the slave, it, it was like a synonymous to a servant slave and servant so he he was not really really especially in israel uh, he was not in a very desperate situation <clears throat> I, I remember i read about rome uh, even in ancient rome uh, do you see uh, in ancient rome there were so many slaves many many slaves and uh, i read that one uh, at one point of time the senators of rome uh, wanted to issue a law, and according to this law, every slave in Rome should have a distingu distinguishing sign. So it could be clear that he is a slave. But later on, they understood that uh, this uh, law would be very dangerous, because in this case, all the slaves in, the, in Rome will see how numerous they are. And there were some cases when the slaves 
could get a very high position in the society. So he could be a slave, but he could be an official. He could he could serve um, in a in a very uh, so he could get uh, every uh, every slave, uh, not every slave, but some slaves could get a very high position in the society. So we can assume, of course, I cannot tell that this is like 100% true, but maybe, maybe uh, Jacob uh, was in the household of uh, Laban, he was considered as a, as a slave. So the same laws were spread upon him as the laws of, uh, of slave, for, for, for the slaves. <clears throat> I can also assume another situation in the story of Jacob and Laban. So uh, most probably what happened at that time. Uh, of course, I also cannot say that this is 100% true, but maybe it happened like this. When uh, Jacob came to, to Laban, at that time, at that time, Laban didn't have sons. He had only two daughters. And when he had two daughters, of course, the main question was uh, who shall inherit his property. So he accepted uh, accepted uh, Jacob, and he was happy that Jacob was serving him uh, for for free. And uh, maybe he he wanted him to be uh, to inherit uh, the the property and everything. But later on, what happened? Very soon after Jacob came. Uh, the sons were born to uh, to Laban. We just know that he had sons, but the Bible doesn't mention how old they, they were. And after that, uh, Laban changed his mind because he didn't want to give all the property to, to Jacob, as probably he promised, but now he wanted to transfer all his property to, to his sons. So that is why he tried to manipulate tried to cheat on uh, Jacob in, in terms of that he wanted to, uh, to diminish somehow this, uh, his property. But we can see that God, other, uh, on the contrary, God blessed Jacob very much and he had more and more and more. And so that is why uh, we can assume that uh, this situation developed like this, but of course we cannot be 100% sure. But anyway, when we come back to the prophecy or to the yes. not prophecy, but to the blessing. Yes, please. Do you have questions? Yes, I have two, two suggestions again. <clears throat> yes, please. Uh, I think when uh, you, you, point, you point out that uh, those blessings did not come to Jacob. Yes. But uh, when uh, we, we see, but when we see, uh, his long period to Laban, to Laban mm -hmm. we see that the, the blessings from God were on him. I we, we, were not were on him. I think uh, he was many many flock from Jacob, but from uh, I mean from from, from Laban, mm -hmm. and uh, you see that he was he, those blessings did not come to upon to Jacob. How, how can we relate those two points? Yes. The second point. Okay. You said that he went, uh, uh, you said that he went to save others, but it was prophesied uh, many times ago to Abraham that his, uh, his uh, posterity will be uh, in slavery before even Jacob uh, took the, 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 the blessings of, uh, of Esau. I want you to clarify those two points. Okay, so let, let, me, let me answer first to the uh, first one. Uh, so just remind me, the first one is... When he was to, uh, in the... He was a shepherd. He was a shepherd oh, yeah. the Yes, the many, many, many is about the blessing. Oh. So what yeah. I would like to tell you is that uh, evidently Jacob was blessed. Uh, nobody can can doubt this, can question this. 
but it was not exactly this blessing, okay? It was another blessing, the blessing that comes from God, not, uh, okay. not this one, do you see? And it's true, yes. and the Bible said that Jacob was blessed, but not because of this particular blessing, but because uh, later on in chapter 28, we can see that God appeared to him and God uh, promised him to, to bless him, okay? So yes. actually, this is the blessing that fulfilled in his life. And uh, what about the slavery? So I think when uh, God says uh, to Abraham that his descendants will be uh, slaves, uh, he um, actually it implies the Egyptian slavery, not that yes. one, but the Egyptian one, because he mentioned the time span, uh, the time period, period of time that they spent uh, as slaves. <clears throat> And it, it fits better the Egyptian slavery than this one. Okay, so, but yeah. uh, it's true that none of these blessings uh, came true in the life of Jacob. For example, uh, we know that when he came back and Pastor Pospo mentioned it, uh, he himself bow, uh, bowed down seven times before, before Esau, not vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it looks like everything uh, was not even fulfilled, but uh, on the opposite. It was uh, he, he got everything opposite to this blessing in his life. And, and now I would like to ask you one more important question. So uh, when we look at this blessing, what is missing here? What is, is is missing? Yes, is to find some people for who are going to work for him, to save him. He did not okay. get some people to save him. Okay, if we compare this blessing with other blessings in the book of Genesis, so what is missing? Divine human relationship. relationship. Okay. What else? Posterity. Okay. What else? The land. The land. So there is no promise that the promised land will be given to, or the land of Canaan will be given to Jacob. There is no promise of great posterity. There is no promise of the uh, like relationship with God. So in this case, we can say that actually this blessing was really not for Jacob. It was for Esau, you understand? And of course, the stolen blessing cannot work out. So God cannot bless a person who is cheating. I mean, who, uh, so it's against, like uh, it is against uh, God, uh, God's, God's nature. So because uh, God cannot bless person who, who is cheating. And uh, we can see that uh, when we look at the further life of Jacob, we can see that many bad things happened to him and it was like a, a reversal or um, God uh, uh, gave back everything evil, all evil things that uh, he, he did. Just uh, those examples are very, very numerous. We'll consider just several of them, for example, and when Jacob comes to Isaac to receive a blessing, he calls himself Esau, the firstborn. I am Esau, your firstborn, Bekor. And later he himself is deceived by Laban when Leah, instead of Rachel, is given him as a wife. And Laban uses the same word firstborn. 
but only in a feminine form. Laban said, it is not so done in our country to give you younger before the firstborn, the Korah. So do you see the same thing happened uh, to Jacob? So uh, he deceived and he is deceived in the, same, in the same manner. Or another example, when Esau comes to his father to receive a blessing, Isaac tells him, your brother came, came deceitfully by, mir, uh, by Mirma, and he has taken away your blessing. When Jacob learned that he married Leah, he used the same word. What is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve with you uh, for Rachel? Why then you have deceived me? And the same word uh, Rama uh, is used, this, the same root. Uh, or for example, when Esau realized that he had lost his blessing forever, he lifted up his voice and wept. When Jacob first met Rachel, he is also weeping. Just as Jacob acquired his birthright for food, Leah also acquired the right for Jacob for her son, uh, for her son Ruben's mandrake. So we can see that everything that Jacob did uh, is uh, returned to him. Uh, another interesting detail is going on in Genesis 33. When Jacob returns home and meets his brother, he says to him, take my blessing, which I brought to you because God has given me and I have everything. The word beracha means gift in this context. So beracha could mean uh, two issues. It could mean a blessing or it could mean a gift as well. So, and uh, evidently here, this word is used with a double meaning. So it is a gift because Jacob gives some uh, gifts to his brother, but also uh, the, uh, there are some other words for gift, like for example, mincha and some others. But the author uh, chooses this word on purpose because uh, he, he, it looks like uh, Jacob understood that this stolen blessing is not working for him. So now he is returning it back to his, uh, to his brother. Uh, so this is in uh, Genesis 33. And now uh, when we look at the life of Abraham and Jacob, we can see that there are some parallels between them. And those parallels uh, can tell us that actually Jacob is considered as the continuation of this uh, lineage of Abraham. I will not pay attention to this very much. Uh, the Egypt uh, motif frames the history of Abraham and Jacob as an inclusion. Abraham at the beginning of the story descends to Egypt and Jacob in the end of his life also go goes to Egypt. Thus the author shows that the whole story of Jacob and Abraham is a single, is a single unit. Yes, uh, one more interesting story happened to uh, Jacob when uh, he was uh, going away from uh, Laban. And this is the story of the stolen domestic idols. So most probably, as we already mentioned, um, Tara and uh, all the relatives of Abraham, they, they worshiped not only the true God, but maybe they also worship some idols. And this story of Laban also emphasizes this. And uh, in this story of the stolen domestic idols, uh, one uh, famous uh, scholar, Cyrus Gordon, uh, he found a very interesting uh, parallel to that story in the Nuzi library. You know that two cities, Nuzi and Mari, are the cities where a big uh, collection of clay tablets were, uh, were found. And uh, this uh, clay tablets actually uh, let light on the life of, uh, on the everyday um, life of, of people in those cities. So there is a document in this library that regulates the inheritance rights of property by the adopted son. 
And some of them <laughs> claims that this is exactly the case described in Genesis 31. According to Nuzi laws, a person with domestic idols has the right to be a firstborn in the family. In other words, Rachel stole birthright for her husband. Again, some repetition of the motif of birthright and blessing can be seen in this episode. So uh, do you see, it looks like uh, Jacob himself uh, stole the, the birthright for, for himself from his brother. And later on, Rachel did the same because uh, those people who, uh, those uh, sons who have uh, these domestic idols, so these domestic idols, we can say, represent or symbolize the birthright. So the, the one who has them, has the birthright. And probably that is why uh, those domestic idols were so important for Laban, because um, in this case, it looks like uh, he gave away the birthright to, to Jacob. So is it clear? Yes, Prof. Okay. Um, Uh, in uh, this story, Jacob's reaction is very important. In his dispute with Laban, he emphasized that, that only God was the source of his blessings. Jacob probably began to realize uh, that the stolen birthright did not bring any, any blessing to him. And a very important story happens when Jacob is coming back to, uh, to, uh, to promised land and when he meets the angels. Uh, please, he, I have a question there, please. Yes, yes, please. How many kind of blessings Jacob stole me from Esau? How many? Yes. Because uh, Esau told him that he 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 stolen his blessing time uh, tw twice. I mm -hmm. think twice. Uh, I think you need to to clarify those two times. Those, those yes. Two times yes. So the first words. time, uh, uh, what uh, Esau? How can we understand the reaction of Esau? Maybe uh, the first time when uh, Jacob changed uh, the blessing for the lentils uh, stew, uh, he understood it also as cheating. Esau understood it also as cheating because uh, maybe he understood it like uh, Jacob used the situation when he was tired, uh, when he was hungry, and he used this uh, situation in order to, um, to offer uh, this stew uh, for for the birthright. So he, he refers to this one as the first time when he was cheated. And the next time he was cheated when uh, Jacob actually uh, dressed himself as Esau and uh, uh, said to his father that he is, the, he is Esau. So these two times uh, Esau mentions in the dialogue with his father. Uh, but as I see, as I see, uh, the blessing that uh, Isaac was going to pronounce was really yes. addressed to Esau, because it, it fits Esau very well. Uh, but God had another plan for Jacob, to bless him okay. not with just earthly blessing, but the blessing mm -hmm. that uh, is the same with the blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and other patriarchs. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, now uh, let us uh, speak about chapter 32 of the book of Genesis because this chapter is important. And uh, this oh, chapter. Sorry. Yes, please. I'm so sorry. No, I just also wanted to mention that when uh, when 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 um, Jacob was 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 robbing Esau for. Um, for, for for the for the first time, he uses the word uh, for birthright. 
uh, but for the second time he uses the word blessing. Okay, uh, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, I just wanted to point that out. In verse 36 uh, of chapter, um, I think of chapter uh, 37, he says, and he said, it's not, no, chapter 27. Prof. Oh yeah, okay, okay, okay. When he's reporting, he says, is he not, um, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has uh, supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright and behold, now he has taken my blessing. Um, so it, it's, it, it plays between uh, uh, Behora and Beracha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the first time he says he stole the birthright and then now he's taking the blessing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, but evidently in the story, it, it looks like uh, these two terms are used interchangeably. No, 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 it's fine. No, no, no I just wanted to note the, the, the terminology yes. Yes. that yes. He, he uses. But uh, it is evident that uh, Esau refers to the same, like, to these two events. Yes. Stealing of uh, birthright and stealing of blessing. Yes. Okay, now let, let, let's move to the chapter 32 when Jacob meets the angel. And this chapter is very, very important because it is like a, in the life of Jacob, it is like a turning point and everything changed after this meeting. And uh, several uh, observations I would like to do. Uh, first of all, this meeting of the angel uh, reminds uh, very much uh, the story of the Garden of Eden. Because you remember that the promised land is a symbol or type of the, of the Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden is protected by, by uh, Herub, by the angel. And we can see in the beginning of chapter 32, when uh, Jacob approaches the promised land, he called this name Mahanaim because he met some angels. Then Jacob became, yes, no, sorry, it is chapter 32. And Jacob went on his way and God's angels met him. When he saw them, Jacob said, this is God's camp. So he called that place Mahanaim. So this is the beginning of chapter 32. And it looks like this land, the promised land is protected, is guarded by those angels, by, and by God's camp. And finally, when he himself is about to cross the border of the promised land, he is fighting with the angel. So uh, uh, do you see, it looks like this angel doesn't want to uh, let uh, Jacob go into the promised land. Because uh, Jacob is a cheater, because Jacob is a sinful person and made a lot of bad things, so he is not worthy to enter the promised land. And the same is true about the Garden of Eden. So we can see that um, Herub guards the, the Garden of Eden from the uh, unauthorized penetration. And nobody can go there without uh, God's permission. But even in that time, uh, we have some exceptions. Like for example, Enoch, um, he, he, he disappeared because he, he was taken to God and most probably he was taken to the Garden of Eden and he is there. So we can see that there are some exceptions. And now what is important in the life of, uh, in the life of Jacob, that he is fighting and he is not able to overcome this uh, supernatural being, the angel. And we know that it was not just the angel, but it was uh, God himself or Jesus himself. Uh, of course, uh, you know that the expression angel of the Lord in the Bible very often uh, means the Lord himself. And in this uh, case, the name of Jacob is changed. So it looks like uh, this change of the name symbolizes the new uh, new beginning 
or that uh, Jacob is born again. So he is not Jacob anymore, but he has a new name. And the new name means new identity. So he is not Jacob, but he is Israel. And uh, the meaning of the name Israel is not very clear. And there are several etymologies, uh, but uh, most probably uh, not uh, the meaning important, but uh, the fact of renaming, of uh, giving a new name is important. Um, Israel becomes the name of entire nation. And after the renaming, it was said for the first time that God had blessed Jacob. But the blessings of the covenant were not repeated this time. God blesses Jacob once more when Jacob returns to Bethel in chapter 35. This time, the renaming was confirmed by the blessings of the covenant. Thus, Jacob made a long journey until he finally received God's blessing. So when we speak about chapter 35, it's also a very, very interesting chapter because when we uh, go back to chapter 28, in chapter 28, we can see that um, Jacob promised God uh, if he comes back safely and uh, if, he, if God blesses him, so uh, he promised to go to Bethel and to build an altar at Bethel and to give uh, the tithe of everything that he has. But what happened to, to Jacob? In, in chapter 32, he comes back to the promised uh, land. And in chapter 33, in the end of the chapter, it says that they actually departed. So Esau went to one direction and Jacob went to another direction. Uh, chapter 33 and verse 18. After Jacob came from Padan Aram, he arrived safely at Shechem in the land of Canaan and camped in front of the city. He purchased a section of the field where he had pitched his tent from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of silver. And he set up an altar there and called it God, the God of Israel. So uh, do you see, in chapter 28, he promised to come back to Bethel. But instead of coming back to Bethel, he stayed at Shechem. And chapter 34 actually tells us about those um, very bad story uh, when uh, his daughter, Dina, Dina, yeah. Uh, I don't know how to say, she was raped or uh, actually uh, the son of uh, Shechem uh, dishonored Dina. And uh, after that, uh, two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, killed everybody in this, in this village. And uh, after that, even Jacob said that uh, now all people in around uh, in the vicinity will hate me. I became hated by the local people. And at that moment in chapter 35, it looks like God is pushing is pushing Jacob. And chapter 35 starts when God appeared to Jacob and, and remind him about the promise that he had given when he uh, was uh, going to Lebanon. God said to Jacob, get up, go to Bethel and settle there. Build, build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Uh, so God pushed Jacob to do this, and we can see that Jacob is is uh, is going to Bethel. And what is also important on the road to Bethel, he uh, actually get he got rid of all those domestic idols that Rachel uh, had stolen from 
uh, from her father. And so it looks like at that moment, Jacob understood that um, all this, all his own efforts to get blessing and to get the birthright are not working in his life. So he wants to get rid of everything. And after that, after that, we can see that God really, uh, that God really blessed him. And he repeated for him the blessing of Abraham. Uh, chapter 35. Uh, verse 8. God appeared to Jacob again after he returned from Padan Aram, and he blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob. You will no longer be, be named Jacob, but your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation, indeed an assembly of nations, will come from you. And kings will descend from you. I will give to you the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac. And I will give the land to your future descendants. <laughs> then God withdrew from him at the place where he had spoken to him. So we can see that this blessing uh, actually came true in his life. And uh, Jacob made a very, very long journey <laughs> until he finally received God's <laughs> blessing. And uh, this story actually teaches us <laughs> <laughs> this story actually also teaches us that do you see we cannot make a shortcut to get a blessing like Jacob wanted to do and all his uh, efforts to get this blessing didn't work out okay so now do you have any any questions Okay, if, if you don't have questions, so let us make a break for 10 minutes and in 10 minutes we will come back. Okay, so now we are going to the story of Joseph. And uh, do remember that story of Joseph is like a continuation of the Toledot of Jacob. And uh, when we start at the story of Joseph, we can see uh, that uh, actually it reminds us about all these bad things that happened in the life of uh, Jacob. Uh, for example, uh, when we speak, uh, when we read about two wives of Jacob, Rachel and Leah, uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a note that it, it says that Israel loved Joseph more than all his brothers. And when we read the story of uh, uh, Leah and Rebecca, uh, Leah and Rachel, uh, sorry, there is a mistake here. Uh, Jacob loved Rebecca or Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. According, accordingly, his love for Rachel uh, passed on to love for his son, Joseph. And surprisingly, Jacob's other sons hated Joseph. The Bible repeats this three times, indicating strong uh, so that their hatred was very, very strong. But what I would like to tell you that actually uh, there is an expression in the uh, in the Bible uh, that uh, Leah is twice described as unloved. Uh, but in the Hebrew, uh, the word that is used is hated. So uh, it is not just uh, Jacob didn't love Leah, but the uh, verb that is used there is Jacob hated Leah. And do you see now when uh, all sons of uh, Jacob hate, hate uh, Joseph, it looks like again this boomerang 
continues uh, continues to work in the life of the patriarch and even in the life of his uh, son. Uh, when Rachel saw that uh, she bore Jacob no children, she envied Kana, her sister. She said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. And his uh, brothers were jealous, and the same word is used of him, because his father kept the saying in mind. So do you see, the same is repeated in the life of the son. 20 shekels was the usual uh, fee for a slave of the age between 5 and 20 years old in Babylon and in Israel. And uh, Joseph is sold just for 20 shekels. And Jacob uh, deceived his father by dressing in uh, goat's skin. And now his sons are cheating on him by using goat's, uh, goat's blood. So they, they do remember they brought the garment of uh, Joseph and said to, to Jacob, please recognize whose garments or whose clothes is this. So uh, they, uh, Jacob used the cloth to cheat and they also used uh, cloth to cheat. So we can see that everything is repeated to, uh, to, to Jacob, but already in the lives of his sons. Uh, one more thing I would like to, to add about the, the cloth of, um, of uh, Joseph that Jacob uh, gave him. And we know that uh, the same actually cloth uh, was the one who uh, worn by Thamar, the daughter of David. So it looks like it was a really very rich cloth. And in ancient times, in ancient times, uh, cloth or garments are very, very, very expensive. Uh, usually because it was impossible to do by, by themselves. So in order to have a cloth, you need to buy it, to purchase it from, from somebody. And uh, just ordinary people cannot produce it uh, at the household. So uh, that is why uh, the cloth was very, very expensive. So do you remember e even during the Jesus times when um, he was crucified, the soldiers, uh, the soldiers uh, cast uh, the lot for, for the garments, for the garments of Jesus because it was, it was quite, quite expensive. Or for example, when uh, Samson, uh, he, he was cheated by his wife when, uh, uh, when she uh, revealed to her relatives uh, the riddle. Uh, so do you remember he, uh, he took, he, he killed 30 people and he uh, took away the cloth in order to give uh, to the to her uh, wife's relatives. So even the cloth from uh, killed people was considered uh, value valuable. So cloth was very very expensive, and especially expensive was the uh, colored cloth, because at that time um, it it was like a secret only. Uh, people, for example, from Tyre, the city of Tyre, they knew how to uh, make, uh, for example, the, uh, the garment to make it red. So the purple uh, garment was very, very expensive at that time. And when, jo uh, when Jacob uh, gave to, uh, to Joseph, when uh, Jacob gave to Joseph this garment, it looks like he favored him more than other uh, other his sons. And of course, it also a sign that most probably he would like to make him a firstborn in the family. By the way, when we speak about the firstborn, we can see that uh, we have like two candidates. So one candidate, uh, so he has two wives. If we don't uh, take into consideration all the concubines or the slaves, slave girls or slave uh, servants. So he had two wives. And Reuben was the firstborn according to the, born to, to the Leah. 
and uh, Joseph was also the firstborn uh, from Rachel. So it looks like Joseph was also a candidate to be uh, firstborn. Uh, but what is interesting in the story, chapter 37 of the book of Genesis ends when uh, Joseph is uh, sold to the Madianites and for, uh, eventually he appeared in Egypt. And after that, there is a kind of break or uh, the narrative changes and we have the story about Judah and Tamar. And uh, usually people, especially the liberal scholars, they consider the story about Judah and Tamar as a later insertion. Uh, but actually when we uh, more attentively look at this story, we will see that it is not an, an addition or something that is um, um, not crucial here, but on the contrary, this chapter, chapter 38, is very, very important in this particular context. And it has many connections, uh, especially to chapter 37 and to the uh, following uh, narratives. Uh, okay, so now let us consider some of those uh, connections. Uh, first of all, when we see the story of Judah and Thamar, uh, we can find uh, some interesting parallels uh, with the uh, story of Eve. So do you remember uh, those repetitions or the repetition of the same verbs we can find here? For example, there Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her. So do you remember the same verbs were used in the uh, story of Eve and later on in the story of the sons of uh, God and it is repeated again and again. So even uh, here we can see that this uh, act of uh, Judah was actually not very good. So it reminds us about the scene, about the first scene. And already this fact negatively characterizes Judah. And what is also uh, very bad, that he married to a Canaanite woman. And Canaan, according to the prophecy, uh, is supposed to be cursed. So in this case, uh, blessing and curse cannot be mixed, cannot be mixed up. And of course, uh, there is a question. There is a question about uh, who uh, will go next, who will inherit the promise of the, of the covenant. And now we can see that uh, he had three sons, uh, but all these sons, uh, at least two of them are reported as bad. So the first one, Er, and his name Er is uh, like also, if we change two letters, we will have the word wicked, Ra. So he was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And it looks like there is a word play with this, with this name. And we don't know the reason of his wickedness, but we just know that he, uh, he died. And after him, uh, the wife remained and uh, the wife's name was Thamar. Uh, and uh, he, uh, according to the law of leverage marriage, uh, Judah gave Tamar to his uh, second son, and his second son is Onan. And again, here, uh, the most important word in this chapter, not in this chapter, but in this narrative is seed. The word seed is repeated in verse 8 and 9 three times. In this case, the author specifically points to a promise of many descendants which was given to the patriarchs. So you know what Onan uh, has done. And uh, actually uh, the problem with Onan was that according to the law of leverate marriage, uh, the son who is born to, to his sister-in-law uh, is supposed to be the son of his brother. So it will not be his son. And in this case, uh, uh, the, the right of the firstborn 
would be given to uh, to his uh, older brother, not to him. But most probably here, Onan also wanted to get the birthright. That is why he didn't want to continue the line of his brother. And uh, what is interesting, uh, that um, the word waste, which is used in, in English translation, but in Hebrew, the word that is used is shechet, and shachat actually means to kill. So what he did with the seed, he killed the seed uh, when he didn't want to continue the line of his brother. So in this case, uh, we can see that he made a crime against the seed. And according to the prophecy, he uh, actually in Genesis 3.15, uh, it says that actually this seed is supposed to overcome the, the enemy. And the hope for the salvation is in the seed. So uh, furthermore, the Bible tells us, uh, be fruitful and multiply. And this is part of the blessing. And he uh, was against all those blessings. So he was against the fulfillment of the pro pro prophecy and the fulfillment of God's blessing. So that is why uh, the, the Lord also killed, killed him. And now we have uh, the next son who remained is Jela, but he is very young. And Judah, uh, uh, Judah doesn't want to give uh, uh, his uh, youngest son to Thamar as a husband. And uh, here we have also many connections with the previous chapter, chapter 37 of the book of uh, Genesis. Uh, Judah and his brothers deceived their father using Joseph's clothes. Now the cloth is used again for the deception. And you know the, uh, 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 what, what Tamar did. He dressed as, uh, as a prostitute and he was sitting at the crossroad and uh, Judah one day came to her and she got pregnant from, from him. So sexual relationship with the daughter-in-law uh, are prohibited and they should be punished by death. The fact that Tamar demanded a seal and a cane as, uh, 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 as this one, as um, to save God, suggests that uh, Judah was the head of the family and he was the head of the tribe as well. So uh, this uh, element seal and cane or this rod was actually the elements of the head of the clan. And uh, now uh, we need to consider one more important issue in this story. Uh, so uh, do you remember uh, when we go to Genesis chapter 48, 49, sorry, we can see in this chapter that uh, uh, Jacob blessed all his descendants, all his sons. But as I mentioned to you, some of these blessings were not like blessings, but were like curse. So for example, when we speak about his firstborn, Ruben, he said that he will not be the first anymore because he also committed uh, bad things. Uh, so he will not be the, the first one. When we speak about uh, two next, his sons, Simeon and Levi, he says that also they, um, they are not worthy to be the first. And the next one in this line is Judah. So uh, do you see Judah most probably now plays a role of the firstborn in the family of Jacob. And he is a prominent leader in the this, in this story. And we can see that he plays a very, very important role. So uh, when we look at this narrative of chapter 37, 38, and uh, so on, we can see that we have two candidates to be the firstborn. The first candidate is Judah, and the second candidate is uh, Joseph. As, as I explained to you, Judah is the firstborn because the previous sons uh, are not worthy. Judah is the next candidate to be the firstborn from Leah, 
and Joseph is the firstborn from Rachel. And now the story is built in such a way so that we can see the contrast between two candidates to be the firstborn in the family of Jacob. So the one is Judah, another one is Joseph. But because Jacob doesn't know that uh, Joseph is alive, so for him only one son is supposed to be the firstborn, and this is Judah. <coughs> And one more very, very interesting uh, thing that we can find in the story of uh, Judah and Ta Ta Thamar is that when Judah finds out that Thamar is pregnant, he demanded that she should be burned. And uh, this punishment was reserved only for the uh, daughter of a priest according to Leviticus 21 and 9. So if a daughter of a priest uh, committed a fornication, she is supposed to be burned. But in all other cases, when um, somebody uh, committed the same crime, he or she is supposed to be stoned, not burned. So uh, this fact actually tells us that Judah considered himself to be a priest in the family. So all those facts tells, uh, tell us that Judah is a firstborn in, in the family of Jacob. Okay, is it clear? So he has a road, he has uh, all these uh, requisites of the firstborn, of the head of the clan, and he also considered himself a priest. And we know that in, in ancient times, the firstborn was a priest in the, in the family. Uh, okay. Uh, and again, the story uh, is the reflection of the story of Jacob's deception. And she said, please identify whose these are, the synod and the court and the staff. And we remember that the same phrase was said by the sons of Jacob. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, this we have found, please identify. And the same phrase is used, whether it is your son's robe or not. So we see that there is a repetition of the same, same motifs. And, uh, and now when we compare, when we compare two of these candidates to be the firstborn, Judah and Joseph, we can see a, a contrast because uh, Judah is not portrayed as a, as a worthy one, but Joseph, on the, on the contrary, uh, he is much better presented than Judah. For example, uh, Judah in chapter 38 united with the foreign woman, but Joseph run away from the foreign woman. So after that, we can see the description of immorality because uh, Judah came to, the, uh, to his uh, daughter-in-law, but he, of course, he didn't know because she was dressed as a prostitute. And Joseph, in the story of Joseph, we can see purity. So he's, uh, in, in, in this situation, he was very, um, uh, uh, he kept uh, the high moral standards. So Judah is presented as a deceiver because he deceived his uh, daughter-in-law, Thamar, and he didn't want to give uh, her uh, his youngest son, Shala. And Joseph is deceived. In Judah, we can see the God's judgment when uh, his sons were killed because they were evil, they were wicked. And uh, Joseph, on the contrary, he gets God's blessing. Uh, in the story of Judah, uh, we can see that a uh, woman accused uh, Judah, but this accus accusation was uh, justified. But Joseph is uh, uh, also accused by a woman, but falsely accused to the woman. And we can see the confession of sin in this story uh, of uh, Judah and uh, Joseph runs away from sin. So we can see that 
there is a big contrast be between these two characters, uh, Judah and Joseph. And of course, Joseph is um, more um, pleasant and more, how to say, uh, more worthy to be the firstborn. Uh, the phrase the Lord was with Joseph occurs four times in Genesis, and this is uh, the secret of Joseph's success. It is possible to say that Joseph is an antitype of Israel as a nation. While in prison, he asks the cupbearer to remember him. The words he speaks to the cupbearer are reminiscent of God's action to save his people. Remember, and show mercy and bring me out from this house. So it reminds when God said, I brought you out of the house of slavery from the land of Egypt. Uh, his request resembles the salvation of all Israelites from Egyptian slavery. Uh, yes, please, Pastor Postwa. Please go back to the previous slide, Prof. Yes. No, 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 This uh, the one after this one. Yes, uh, that, that contrast is, is, is beautiful, by the way. It's interesting that Judah ended up being the one through whom the, the Messiah would come, even with that contrast. But I wanted to, to come to when he says, uh, he asks for the cup bearer to remember him. And in previous narratives, like for example, with Noah, it's God who remembers uh -huh. Noah. And 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 uh, uh, it's like that covenantal language as you were as you yes. were as yes. you were explaining to us, but here we see Joseph asking a man to remember him. Could that be a stylistic way of of, of writing from 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 the author? It, could there be significance to that in relation to God remembering um, uh, people? in that um, term being used as, as, as a covenantal language, God saving his people, um, and now expecting, uh, Joseph expecting that role to be played by a human. Yes, yes, yes. Maybe, um, as I mentioned to you earlier, maybe we consider it as a kind of uh, lack of faith from uh, Joseph's side. So he, he is not trusting God, but he trusts in a in a person. And we can see that actually this, uh, the cup bearer didn't remember him until God reminded him to, to remember. So uh, it took a long time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this comment. So I think, I, I think it is not uh, a coincidence, but uh, this, uh, it is a deliberate cho cho choice of words here. So this remember is somehow related to uh, remember of uh, previous cases. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, I, are you going to make a point about the contrast from the previous slide of the two characters at the end and which one ends up being the one to carry the Yes, yes, of course, okay, we'll no come question. to this. So this is an important question. Who got uh, the birthright, Joseph or Judah? Because so far we can see uh, there are two candidates. One is Joseph, one is Judah. And uh, the story is not clear until this moment because do you see, uh, Jacob doesn't know that Joseph is alive and uh, he actually already happy that Judah is his uh, the main in the main here of his uh, of all the brothers. So uh, so far Judah is the firstborn so far, but we will see what happened next. Uh, so uh, we spoke about this uh, good and evil in the, in the narrative how it is important. And also we can see that uh, the wisdom was given to Joseph by God. The author returns to the lesson that we, was taught at the very beginning of the book. The ability to distinguish between good and evil is given by God. It can be obtained in another way. At the end of the book of Genesis, God is described as the one who can turn evil into good. 
So we, we spoke about this. And uh, one more uh, very interesting issue uh, I would like to emphasize in the story of Joseph. In the story of Joseph, uh, do you see the garment or the cloth uh, plays a very, very important role. So in the beginning of the story of Joseph, we can see that everybody took away his garment. For example, the brothers, they took away the garment of uh, Joseph and sent him, uh, sold him to slavery. And uh, the garment they brought back to, to the father. Uh, later on in the, uh, in, the, in the prison, not in the prison, but uh, in the house of Potiphar, he was also undressed by the uh, Potiphar's wife. So do you remember he took his garment and uh, he just ran away and the garment was left in the hands of uh, Potiphar's wife. So it looks like everybody uh, undresses uh, Joseph in the first part of the story. Uh, but later on, we can see uh, that uh, when Pharaoh uh, uh, and bring him uh, to, to the court, Pharaoh dressed him back. So this dress is an important, or cloth is an important part of uh, the construction of this narrative. So in the beginning, he was given a dress and in the, not in the end of the story, but um, when his uh, misfortunes are over, he is again given the dress one time by Pharaoh, another time by, by his father. So the, the cloth is very important in the construction of, of the narrative. And uh, this uh, idea of good and evil is also, <coughs> excuse me, is also uh, present here. Uh, do you see Joseph is um, a symbol of the restoration of, of Israel. And his actions are very similar, for example, uh, to what God did in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. So when he uh, took his father to, to Egypt, uh, he will tell them, I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. Uh, and it is repeated several times. And of course, it reminds Genesis 131 when Adam was given the best land. So now uh, Jacob is given the best, the best land. Uh, Joseph presents a picture of restoration, not only the restoration of Jacob's, Jacob's blessing, but the restoration of the blessings that were promised to the seed of Jacob and the blessings that were promised to all humanity. So because of him, uh, he is the tool to bless many, many people. Um, so uh, when we speak about the number of the Israelites in Egypt, we can see uh, that uh, there is also some very interesting uh, numbers, that when they come to Egypt, there were 70 of them. There were 70. And uh, 70 is a very interesting number because uh, somebody counted, I didn't count myself, so you can check, is it... Uh, correct or not, that the number of nations listed in Genesis 10, this is the so-called table of nations, is also 70. And if you take into the consideration of the verses written in Deuteronomy 32, 8, it says here, uh, when the Most High gave to the nations the inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. So in this case, the number of the sons of God is uh, 70, yes, and it looks like um, uh, the all nations in the, in the entire world are also 70. So in this case, we can say that Israel is presented as a new humanity or humanity in miniature, that the hairs of God's promise to all other nations. So by presenting them as 70, uh, it actually points out to the number of the nations. And in this case, Israel is a new humanity, like humanity in miniature. 
And uh, when we read uh, the continuation of the story of Judah, we can see that uh, there are several times Judah is um, several times Judah is emphasized. So, for example, he is the one who is leading uh, people to Egypt, uh, the sons of Jacob to Egypt, and it is clear that he uh, plays an important role in the narrative as the potential candidate for the firstborn. Uh, when uh, Jacob came to Egypt, we can see that he blessed Pharaoh, and this is uh, the fulfillment of the promises of uh, Genesis chapter 12, when God says to Abraham, you will be a blessing, or you bless others. And when uh, Jacob blessed Pharaoh, it looks like this, uh, um, this prediction was fulfilled. And uh, Oh, it's at the end of the book, yes. Um, but before we go to the end of the book, I would like to ask you a question. So finally, who became the firstborn in the family of Jacob? Judah or Joseph? Joseph. Ju Judah. How do you know that Joseph became a firstborn? Because according to what we have seen in the Bible is that uh, he takes the blessings of Adam and also of Abraham and also his, his sons they, that they born at Egypt, they also taken by Jacob to, live, to, to make the fulfillment of the, of the number that is required. Mm -hmm. Very well. Yeah. So it looks like Joseph got the double portion of inheritance because Jacob took his two sons as his own and all of them got a portion of inheritance. So in this case, we can see that Joseph became the firstborn. Yes, Pastor Posso. Um, when you read in chapter 49, I also see Judah also receiving <laughs> uh, that position as well. I don't know if it, it is possible for both of them. Because in Genesis 49, verse 8, it says, Judah, you are he uh, whom your brother sh uh, shall praise. Your hand shall be in the neck of your enemies and your father's children shall bow down before you. Uh, Judah is a lion's whelp from uh, the prey, my son. You have gone up and stooped down and couched as a lion, and it is an old lion who shall rouse up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the Lord give from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And then it continues. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. It seems like it's painting him as a king, and as he that rules and the brothers coming to him. But of course, I mean, there's um, also uh, messianic uh, 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 descriptions, for example. Uh, can um, you please read? Yes, uh, when we read. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Uh, when we read chapter 39 or 49. So uh, when we compare yes. the blessing of uh, Judah and the blessing of Joseph, you read only the Judah blessing, yes? Yes, yes, I can read the... the, the... Can you please read the blessing can... of Joseph? Verse 22. Okay, I can read it, Prof. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence, the shepherd, the stone of Israel, even by God of your father, who shall help you, and by the almighty who shall bless you with blessings of heaven 
above the blessings of the deep that lie under the blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings of your father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the uttermost um, of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. So do you see, he also has a very, very nice uh, blessing. Mm -hmm. And I would even say that maybe, who knows, we speak about the open history. Yes? Mm -hmm. Maybe at that time, uh, it was not, I, I don't want to say that God didn't know about that, but there was an option for both these sons uh, to, uh, to become the, so that the line of the Messiah could come either through Joseph or through Judah. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was open at that time. Of course, I didn't mm -hmm. want to say that God uh, didn't know about that. He knew everything, mm -hmm. but it looks like he, give, uh, he gives open opportunities for everybody to mm -hmm. get it. So because do you see, he, it says here, the blessings of your father excel the blessings of my ancestors and the bounty of the ancient hills. May the rest on the head of Joseph on the brow of the princes of his brothers. So it looks like uh, Jacob wants to transmit the blessings of his fathers to Joseph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's true. So, That's true. Uh, uh, that is why, that is why. Uh, There's also one, here, Prof. Yes, Prof. Is about, uh, you know, even Joseph himself witnessed uh, the brother boring down before him. But in Judah, there is no witness. It is about the, the prevailing of the, uh, of the descendants who came into power. But within Joseph, there, there was a witness uh, between his brother boring even his father himself before him. And therefore, uh, take being the king of, of the rest. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Prof. Yes. There's also something that um, there's also the, the 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 elements of the blessing as you have been tracing them. Uh, some glimpses of them can be seen in this blessing upon Joseph. Um, because you see uh, the issue of, for example, relationship um, in verse 25. Uh, his relationship with God. There's also the issue of uh, pros uh, posterity in verse 26, and maybe even uh, er the reference to the everlasting hills may also be uh, um, mm -hmm. maybe an allusion to the land. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I just I just was observing that it might need closer observation, but those three elements uh, of the of the uh, the posterity, the land, and also the relationship are seen more in the blessing upon uh, Joseph than upon uh, Judah. And also the fact that, as Brother Karani was saying, that Judah, um, in terms of how they were living out their lives, Judah actually bowed to Joseph. And not only that, at the end, we see Joseph promising to take care of his brothers um, as if he's really a firstborn. That includes Judah. Yes, yes. And the fact that he got the double portion of inheritance uh, also says that he became the firstborn among the brothers. Uh, but of course, in the context of uh, staying in Egypt, it uh, didn't make uh, much sense because anyway, do you see uh, Joseph was like uh, the richest among them. But later on, uh, we will see that uh, this division on Judah and Ephraim uh, is repeated in the life of, uh, of Israel. <clears throat> because Judah is a symbol of the Southern Kingdom and Ephraim is the symbol of the Northern Kingdom. 
And we can see like, uh, I don't want to say rivalry, but kind of, uh, uh, kind of rivalry we can see among those uh, two, two representatives. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, Ephraim and his descendants were not as faithful as Judah and his descendants. Uh, okay, and the final text of the book, uh, the book uh, ends with the death of Joseph. And it is also very, it has a symbolical meaning because we know that the book starts with the, uh, with the life and ends with the death. And it, it looks like this is, um, it shows that uh, the scene actually brings to, to the death. And uh, this is the consequence of sin. Uh, okay, so now we finished uh, the book of uh, Genesis today. And uh, we need to go uh, further to the book of Exodus. But uh, today we don't have time anymore, so probably we have to finish now. And tomorrow we will continue with the book of uh, uh, Exodus.